Good morning, everyone. I am Assemblywoman Catalina Cruz. I represent Jackson Heights, Corona, and Elmhurst in the New York State Assembly. And we are here with the Queens Chamber of Commerce to celebrate the amazing women of our small businesses in Queens that were able to get through the really, really tough time that was uh, this past two years. Um, in order to allow more folks to kind of join us for the webinar, I'm going to pause here, allow a good minute or so, and then we can get started um, in making sure that we hear from our amazing guests today. So I'm gonna mute myself. I'm gonna give it a minute as folks come in, uh, we'll get talking. Does that work for everyone? All right, so I think we should get started. I think uh, we're in a good place um, to have a wonderful conversation. Um, I, as I said a little bit earlier, I am Assemblywoman Catalina Cruz, and I am joining today the amazing folks of the Queen's Chamber of Commerce to celebrate Women's History Month by talking to some amazing small business owners. They're going to talk to us about uh, the difficulties they faced during the pandemic and how uh, they were able to persevere because women are resilient and we always find a way. And so I want to tell you a little bit uh, about me and the work that I do and why supporting small businesses and why supporting women is so important. Um, I am, sorry, I just wanna make sure. Um, um, I am, uh, I sit on the Small Business Committee. I represent a neighborhood that became the, the epicenter of the epicenter uh, because of the lack of healthcare, because of um, the income that our people would receive every week or so was gone. You know, many of them small uh, worked in restaurants, were uh, in the construction industry, all of the industries that suffered so much during the pandemic. And um, I'll tell you a little bit more about you know, how my team and how our work to help uh, the community survive. But one of the best things we could do was team up with the Queens Chamber of Commerce because when our city government and frankly our state government left our small businesses behind, the uh, team at Queens Chamber, uh, Tom Gretsch and his amazing folks, went out with me literally to these streets in our neighborhood and knocked on the doors of our small businesses and gave them PPE, information about applying for grants, and just simply made sure that people knew what was going on because there was so much information and we'll hear from these amazing women in a minute who will tell you there was so much information and out there, but a lot of it was not clear about what were, was it a grant? Was it a loan? Do we have to pay it back? Do we not? Who qualifies? Who doesn't? But the Queen's Chamber of Commerce was right there supporting our small businesses, making sure that many of them could stay open and the work isn't done. We have a lot more work to do. And right now, I'm coming live to you from Albany, uh, where we are fighting for a state budget that's really, truly going to support our community and by extension, our small businesses. I am a firm believer that it is our small businesses that are going to get us out of this economic crisis. It is the women here in their ingenuity and in, in, in going back and forth. And you'll hear from them and the work that they did of really thinking creatively of how do I keep my doors open and how do I keep my employees? And frankly, how do I continue to, to be an entrepreneur and make a little bit of money? Um, and so I'm going to leave it there because I think it's going to be a great conversation. And what we're going to do is they're each going to introduce themselves. I'd love to hear um, not only about you and how you came to be a business owner, but how, uh, how, how, actually, let's just talk about how you became a business owner, because then we can get into the topic of, of what you did during the pandemic uh, to survive. We can talk a little bit more about that, but tell us about what, where your business is at, what neighborhoods you serve, and what do you do? And let's start with Lena, um, which uh, I love it because it's the ending of my name, Catalina. Um, Lena de la Cruz, welcome. I, I'd love to hear from you about your business. 
<laughs> Thank you, Catalina. Um, my name is Elia de la Cruz again. My company is Control Electro Polishing. We're a metal finishing company that polishes stainless steel majority for the, um, the medical and pharmaceutical industries. Um, the company was started actually by a gentleman named Charlie Morla in the 1950s in Long Island. And then because of um, a lot of help with the government, he was able to move into an economic zone in Brooklyn. And we've been, the factory has been in Brooklyn since 1972. So it's, you know, it's, it's so good, good facials, you know, facial cream. <laughs> Um, in 1991, my mother actually, she became the business owner after being an admin assistant to the own, prior owner for many, many years. Um, he actually suffered from Alzheimer's, the poor gentleman. And um, she had a, uh, an opportunity to buy the company. And even though her attorney thought she was insane, she ended up buying it. And it's been a family company for years now. I'm her daughter. Um, and it's a great industry. Um, it's one that we, you know, we never know how many fingers metal finishing, um, uh, metal finishing can touch in one's life. You know, every part that has to deal with the human condition, the body, your cell phone, even, you know, things in your household, how many times those need to be medically treated, um, so they don't become corroded and they don't harm the human body. Um, so it's a great it's a great thing to be part of. And here we're talking about employment through the pandemic. Um, it was a crazy time. We um, we had a lot of our employees getting sick, even though we you know we we got the um, the incentive of OSHA to tell you know to separate social distance. We did all those things, but even then we couldn't control the outside environment. So we had a lot of employees who in it was almost like in batches, a group of them would end up sick and they would be out. And it caused us to first to look at who we had in store in house, like who were the employees that we needed to push them to be better, to step up to the occasion, to um, to fill those positions. And also we had to start looking at our training methods to make sure that if God forbid our line operator for passivation was out, uh, who was going to step in his shoes? Because we know we know that the owner or the production manager he knows the job, but who else below them knows the job? Um, then from there, we actually looked into local nonprofit uh, workforce development um, locations to help us fill in the temporary employees that we needed, because that was very important for us because we were going through a time where we were normally in normally employ about 25, 26, 27 people at a time. And we were dealing with a staff of only, I know 15 doesn't sound like a lot, but trust me, losing about 10 people, it's, it's, it's very hard. It's very difficult because everybody is important. Everybody, you know, you're part of a family. And then when we, when that didn't work out, we actually went to, in, we actually went publicly to Indeed, we, and um, Indeed, and ZipRecruiter, and even during the pandemic, they were very good because they gave, we, I've never dealt with those types of platforms ever before because we've always dealt with our local um, workforce development. So for us dealing with them, their platform was very easy to use. They give you like templates that you can work on. You could do text messaging through there. So you were always constantly in contact with um, the people that you were trying to hire. And the only interesting thing was is that we were trying to keep social distancing and it was very difficult to um, held interviews because my production manager, he's very old fashioned. He's like, oh no, we gotta do this in person. This person can, I can't do it through a, a, a Zoom. Um, I can't read them through a Zoom interview. So that was the only um, obstacle that we incurred through there. <laughs> but you, man you managed to do quite a lot and you managed to keep your doors open. And I think that's absolutely commendable. And to hear that it's, uh, 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 mommy's business you <laughs> now get to run. It's absolutely beautiful. And, and, and look, I, I have to say that that is the quintessential, uh, uh, you know, come up story, your mom to be the admin, to be able to buy the small business that you now get to run is absolutely amazing. Quite the story to share during Women's History Month. And so thank you for that. Um, and thank you for keeping so many people employed. And now we want to welcome uh, Kelsey Zemba, who's going to talk to us about uh, her business and how she was able to maintain through the pandemic. 
Hi, everyone. How are you? I'm happy to be here. Uh, my name is Kelsey Zimba, and I'm the owner of Zimba Collections. And I wanted to talk to you about um, sort of how we transitioned and met a really high demand that came to us throughout the pandemic. Um, so one of the lines that I have under Zimba Collections is Z Form Uniform, um, which is a high-end uh, uniform collection that caters to the casino, hotel, restaurant, nightclub market. So we make custom uniforms, um, especially like cocktail dresses, um, women's suits, men's suits, shirts, blouses, etc. And um, we produce majority of it made in America and majority of it right here in the New York City area. So we work with a lot of um, local manufacturing, um, local fabric suppliers, and have a really great network around um, Queens and Brooklyn and Manhattan with that. Um, so during the pandemic, um, you know, that industry was obviously hit super hard, the hotel industry, the restaurant industry. Um, so our business probably fell to like 35% of what it normally is. Um, and we just, you know, we're trying to stay afloat with breaching that difficult period. Um, during this time, I saw on the news, um, the governor talking about the need for PPE, especially like medical gowns. Um, and that he would give um, preferential ordering to local manufacturing. So I saw this and I was like, oh, well, we, you know, we have a, a ton of local manufacturers that we work with. We can definitely produce these medical gowns. Um, so it took a couple months to understand all the needs of what the medical grounds require. Um, they have very specific requirements in terms of like testing, um, materials, you know, size specs, all of that. Um, so made some prototypes, got them all tested out, did the sourcing materials, all of that, everything passed all of the requirements, um, and then just started to put it out there just to help, you know, hey, we're making medical gowns, if anybody needs, let us know, we have some. And, you know, at first we were doing a few orders, a few small orders for like hospitals, um, nursing homes, and um, then all of a sudden it became large government orders. So we did a large order for um, New York state and a large order for Arizona state and actually ended up shipping like millions of medical gowns. So it became an amazing opportunity an amazing business, not only to keep my company afloat, my employees um, you know, still employed, but also support tons of local manufacturers because we were able to split up the order with all sorts of different small manufacturing um, and keep everyone you know in business during the pandemic and it really helped bridge that gap that people needed where their normal business was really slow um, so it was amazing it was really a win-win situation and i think you know all of a sudden needing to produce millions of units in just you know a couple months it's really like the team effort that's what made it work um you know it's working with the whole team of my employees all the manufacturers all the fabric suppliers and everyone definitely felt um you know a passion to make it work and get it done because they knew that what they're making was helping people so um so it was great and that's quite a quite a change you know we had a small business in in our neighborhood that actually I uh, did quinceanera dresses and, and wedding dresses. And nice. um, during, and, and, I'm, and I tell the story because although it sounds nice, you'll see how it ends. They shifted into making masks. But when you don't have necessarily the structure that you seem to have, Kelsey, and that's commendable, it might not work. And for you, it did. For this small business, mm -hmm. it didn't. Um, and unfortunately, they closed, but they had a very successful run. They were in the community for 30 some odd years. And I think the, the, the owner was already looking to retire. But I say this because I think when you have the structure, the support of uh, um, entities like the Queen's Chamber who can literally guide you through a lot of this, it makes it much easier to be able to make that transition, to be malleable to what uh, the, um, the situation requires. Um, and so thank you for sharing that. And with that, um, I'd love to introduce, um, sorry, I muted myself before I finished introducing you. Um, I'd love to introduce Asra Kalfan Kermali. Did I pronounce it correctly? Mm -hmm. Yay. All right. Welcome. Talk to us about your business and what uh, your um, Plaques by Astra is all about. 
Yeah, thank you so much, Assembly uh, Woman Catalina. It's so good to see you always and happy international, well, Women's History Month to everyone here and to all the men out there that are supporting us to get this done. Um, so my name is Azra and uh, basically my parents, um, the owners of Plaques by Ezra initially moved to the United States over 50 years ago with that American dream and a few, year, a few years later, my mom had me and my dad actually bought her the business plaques by Ezra and I was the namesake. Um, we've been doing plaques and awards for many years and uh, 25 years now I've been involved. And about like six, seven years ago, I actually bought the companies from them and, and now I'm the owner. It just so happens that when I think it was mid-February, I started seeing cancellations uh, for award orders. And as soon as the pandemic hit, you know, our phone stopped ringing. I mean, even telemarketers weren't calling us. The worst part is that Elmhurst, and you know, this was the epicenter. I was born and raised in Elmhurst and it was so hard to see the loss of life. I didn't know First of all, we didn't even know what's going to happen. But then just to imagine going back to our neighborhood and missing those people that would no longer be there. It was really heartbreaking, to say the least. Um, and I guess that's what made me grateful that even though there, were, there wasn't any business or anything like that, it gave me the ability to kind of focus on something new. I knew the awards business and I knew that whatever happens, nobody can ever take that you know, talent and creativity away from me. Um, but it, it gave me a lot of time to kind of reflect on what was happening around us because in May we saw, um, you know, Breonna Taylor's story and George Floyd's story. And this was really hurtful in terms of like all the unconscious biases that we face um, as, you know, as a Muslim who observes yes, there is always that little bit hesitation from people. And I get it. I understand. Um, but I do realize that through education and understanding, people can build bridges between communities and it would just allow for harmony and kind of like, um, you know, acceptance. And so I came up with a concept and it was so crazy how this all came together very soon. Uh, very, very quickly was um, a way in a box. So we were fulfilling holiday gifts for some of my clients. And, and I'm like, you know what, if we could add a cultural twist to this, it would allow people to understand. And my client was really okay with it, uh, but we just were crunched with time. So we were just going ahead and doing what we had to do. And uh, before you know it, I was like writing down a business plan and of course, with all the resources out there, with all the webinars that are going on for women, especially, I started writing a business plan on how I could develop a way in a box. And what that is, is a cultural intelligence program um, to, to not only employ, uh, engage employees, but also to train leaders on different cultures. So we basically bring the world to you one country at a time, and it's a sensory uh, journey. So you'll get to taste, you'll get to hear, you'll get to see, hold, you know, um, touch and feel and, and experience a different country. So whether it's uh, Mexico or, you know, if, if it's Cuba or if it's like uh, Tanzania, India, the Middle East, what I felt and what I've gotten feedback is that people wanted more of it. They just wanted to kind of sit down and learn more. It's almost like the deprivation of traveling now that the travel was coming to them the country was coming to them they felt like oh my god the best compliment that i got is when a man took the box home and of course he explained uh to his family about this little transportation to uh the middle east his his wife and two daughters wanted to take the class because or take the the training because they were so intrigued by a different culture to be able to wear something from, you know, either India or the Middle East, they found it really uh, interesting and, and uh, thought provoking. The other thing that we focused on is the businesses around us. So of course, I'm not providing, I, I'm kind of curating these products, but I'm not the supplier, but I made it, I was very intentional to use small 
local minority owned and women owned businesses in the box. So all the products that you're going to be getting are really sourced locally and specifically from uh, MWBEs and local and small businesses. The other thing that I felt was really important is to give back. So we're kind of giving back to more unconscious bias training because we ourselves learned. And, and I think after receiving a training myself, I realized, oh my God, I'm so biased. Why not? Like, we all have it in us. I think it's important to recognize that and then work on it. And so that's where we're at with the way in a box. Wow, Azra. I think there's so many dimensions to what you were doing. It made me think not only of how isolated we were during the pandemic and how many of us would routinely do things like look at Instagram vacation spots and kind of dream a little bit. So this allowed people to have a little bit of a, a kind of a mental break about everything that was happening while learning and, and, and actually working on these uh, 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 biases that we all have that sometimes we don't recognize um, e intentionally or unintentionally. And I think it's just a beautiful thing. And it also made me think, um, and here's a, a pitch since uh, for uh, your possible evolution of this, there are children with special needs, sensory type activities and boxes. And it made me think, so my, my godson ha, is, has special needs. He absolutely loves planes in, in, in other countries. And he's six and knows every country that you can think of. And so it made me think like, that could be the evolution of your, of your boxes. How do we involve children? You know, the, this is fantastic. Um, and, and the fact that you involved locally sourced products uh, right here in Queens is, well, I'm in Albany, but right there in Queens, it's amazing. Um, I'd love to ask a few questions of you all uh, in, in, in kind of thinking through, um, uh, through how do we as government and how do we as the chamber support small businesses and support um, women who are engaging in, in, in kind of these endeavors. Um, if you had, uh, I'd love to start with you, uh, Kelsey. If you had to give me uh, one of best lesson or lesson learned, what would be like your top line of the thing that you said, you say over the last few years, here's what I learned and how we can apply it. Um, I would say be open to other opportunities and be open to areas that are that um, complement your current business, um, because that certainly was a huge reason why we not only survived, but thrived throughout the pandemic. Um, and, and I think always being aware of the community around you and how much all of that, um, you know, is a great resource for you and then you for them. Like, likewise, I think keeping that community of your network um, is super important. And I'm a big fan of the, you know, the saying, the teamwork makes the dream work. And I think that that's totally, totally the truth because it was a team of us that made this all happen and continues to make the company happen. And that is so invaluable. And then also experiencing um, government contracting for the first time with doing, uh, you know, all of these medical gowns, it made me realize for my business that that might be another, um, you know, brand or section that we want to go into because it was such an interesting area and really did complement our existing business with uniforms because uniforms also, you know, require certain, um, certain levels of testing, certain levels of performance, durability, et cetera. So it, it made sense in the, the medical gown area as well. Um, so those are the key things I would say. Thank you, Kelsey and, and Lena. Um, if you had your perfect ask, if you have one opportunity to tell government, here's what every small business needs, or here's what you can do better, what would be like your dream thing that you could say, government, I need you to do this and I need you to do it right? Well, or it I'm could like, be a couple of things. <laughs> <laughs> I think my biggest thing is that you guys already started a wonderful job funding nonprofit organizations that help to educate, to help them find people find employment, because that's, you know, before having to go to the platforms of Indeed, we always strive because to give you a little tidbit, it's because of that organization that my mother found the job as, as an assistant admin. 
And because of the owner seeing that she had, you know, that she was great, that she was, you know, she was intelligent, she understood everything, she was great at chemistry. It was because of that door opening that, and it's, it was because of a government program. So continue, having government to continue funding and funding more that, you know, a lot of kids from poor neighborhoods can get educated and, you know, they, their their dreams can be, you know, because a lot of people, they're like, if they're not exposed to um, certain industries, like, you know, you, you know, designing, uniform making, metal finishing, um, you know, no one, you know, everyone thinks like, oh, I want to be a basketball player. I want to be a model. I want to be, a, you know, but they don't know about the people behind the scenes. So giving kids that exposure, giving young adults that exposure, having them do internships in those types of industries helps to increase us, increase our work. You know, we have a choosing of our workforce personnel because they have the experience and they're open to this. And, and I think you're completely right in that because the reality is the trades are just as important in keeping our economy as um, as would be a degree at college, but not everybody wants one, not everybody needs one, and uh, not everybody could afford one, but we can afford to invest in our nonprofits to have better workforce development support, uh, because as you say, ultimately that is an avenue to get uh, folks into these industries. Um, and so thank you for that. And Asra, uh, if you had one piece of advice for women who are either uh, thinking of opening their business or have already opened their business and are struggling because the reality is the three of you worked hard. And so it wasn't luck that you were able to keep your doors open. The three of you worked really, really hard through the pandemic, but not everybody has had the same opportunities. Um, and some of them may be thinking, is this even worth it? Should I keep my doors open? Uh, my advice to them is call the Queen's Chamber. They'll help you. But Asra, what is your advice to women like that? Well, yeah, for sure. I do think you should call the Queen's Chamber. It has been a wonderful um, kind of connector for us. Um, they, they've been holding our hands in terms of the grants that was um, offered to Queen's businesses. But realistically, there are more resources out there. And I believe women, men don't take advantage of them and, and are not aware of it. Our voices are really important. So I'm very active at, with the Goldman Sachs Voices um, to share my feedback with, you know, Congresswomen and men and, uh, you know, senators and all that. And I think that that's important because realistically, you're sitting in Albany, you don't know what's going on in our business. We will, you know what, I actually welcome you to come in and shadow us one day to see all the things. Would love to. Do. Please, uh, please, Tom, Tom please. Gretch and I will be all over that. Would love oh. to. <laughs> you know, if you were to come to see what we do in a day's time, I have to deal with creating, marketing, delivering, you know, um, raising our voices and our concerns, okay? I have, uh, I'm dealing with eviction issues right now. So it's not easy, the things that we have to deal with. And, you know, it's a, a lot of people don't want to spend that time to kind of get involved with sharing our, our voices. But I do think that as small business owners, it's important. It's really important to kind of reach out and see what's out there for us. I saw that a lot of the um, foundations that are created by many of these companies out there are doing great. You know, um, I get to meet some of them through the chamber and they've been so generous to kind of offer either a space or a place, you know, for us to kind of grow, which is awesome. The, the some of them have foundations where they're actually given us grants, which is great um, in terms of uh, networking. That's awesome. Um, marketing and that help uh, New York City Small Business Network has been awesome in kind of giving uh, support to recreate like websites. So for Away in a Box, I needed a brand new website. I needed so many different resources. And guess what? Queen's Chamber was like, well, we have that for you. And so there, there are so many resources out there that I feel are untapped. My advice to new business owners and existing ones is that you need to go out there and look. And I feel like the second you take a step, you'll see the doors opening for you. And just, 
go through it, you know, and go for it. Thank you for that. You know, I, I think getting to hear from other women who have um, who have either successfully come out the other end of, of uh, what I think it's the, the beginning of the end of this pandemic, uh, or women that frankly are still struggling and looking to make sure that they can keep their doors open because it is, it's very real. While you guys maintained what you talked about, Ezra, of still struggling with, with, with rent issues, with uh, overhead, with making sure that you're meeting your own demand, it's a very real um, situation for many small businesses. And, and I think our government um, can continuously do better. I, I, I'd be the first to, um, to say that uh, our state agencies and our city agencies failed uh, our small businesses during the pandemic in, in many ways. Um, we basically gave you the uh, absolute, absolute bare minimum um, and uh, then, um, then took a uh, uh, victory lap as if that was a lot. And many of you, had it not been for the Queen's Chamber or similar entities, wouldn't have stayed open. If many of you had to rely on each other to be able to stay open, and I think we can do better. We, you have helped keep our, our coffers and our taxes and, and all of the money that we need to run the government uh, uh, full. Yet when it's time to help you, you know, we haven't always prioritized small businesses in the way that we need to. Uh, one of the the projects that I look to do, um, and and how I got creative during the pandemic was. Um, in government offices like mine and legislative offices were always thought of the place where you go get uh, an application for housing or uh, my unemployment has issues or I have an immigration issue um, or uh, let, this is the person that's going to help pass our state budget or, or our, our legislation. And during the pandemic, none of those things felt like they would be what we needed right then and there. And so we closed our doors and we um, turn it into a food pantry. We, we turn our office into a food pantry. Um, and that project, we ended up giving 250,000 boxes of food and, and, and meals um, in partnership with, uh, with um, a nonprofit, as Lena mentioned, nonprofits uh, were uh, lifesavers during the pandemic to help us do the job that we needed to do. But from that grew a project to help um, small businesses, you know, the many family, and I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with this, but uh, our family owned farms in New York state uh, were struggling before the pandemic and during the pandemic even more because we had no restaurants, no schools uh, buying the food that was now going to waste because they had nowhere to send it. So um, in, you know, we partner with them to be able to fund a program called Nourish New York that then gave money to these upstate farms um, to buy their products. And now they had the ability to stay open. And then we came, we brought the food down to New York City to give it out at food pantries like mine and like many others um, in Queens. And we helped you know, a lot of these uh, folks survive uh, the, pa the pandemic. And I think um, women, unfortunately, one of the things we don't always do is, is, is say kudos to ourselves. And I think we all deserve kudos to ourselves for, for in our own way, impacting our community and um, in our ability to maintain sanity as as Asra did um, be able to be uh, healthy and, and keep uh, businesses open as Kelsey and Lena did and so we impacted our community in in our own way and I think we have so much work to do to make sure that um, that we can help you in the next steps of uh, staying open and so I'd like to kind of take us through um, through the next phase of our conversation uh, is uh, is to ask each of you the same question, which is, what does your business need in order to stay open as we as we exit this pandemic? Um, and how do how can we support you? Whether it's a Queen's Chamber, a government, what do you need from us to make sure that you can keep your doors open? Let's start with um, Asra for this one. Oh my God, this is going to be a big one. <laughs> so I don't know if you know this, but we have been at our location for 37 years and literally, yes, yes, literally, we're going to know in the next couple of weeks. And, and it's sad because this building was for sale and I was the first person that my landlord had contacted um, when he was selling the building. But because the pandemic, uh, the demand 
for buildings have, have gone up. There's a lot of foreign investors coming in to buy out the buildings. So he no longer wants to sell to me. Uh, he can get so much more elsewhere. And it's sad because my, I had a conversation already with ongoing with SBA to get a loan for this property. But because of the pandemic, they literally said to me, Azra, everything is so up in the air right now. We got bigger fish to fry. We cannot lend you the money right now. This is not going to happen. Yeah. And Azra, to, to, sorry to interrupt you, but in your lease, did you have right of first refusal um, by any chance? No, no ah. I did not. And also, also, it just so happened that our lease was up. So now we, we have to deal with issues in terms of like, like I said, we're facing eviction and it, it's heartbreaking because not only has Elmhurst been my home, but mm -hmm. uh, I grew up there. I've stayed at that office location more than I have in any of my homes. So for me to tear that away from me is, it's gonna be hard uh, to say the least, but I haven't given up and, I'm, and I won't until the very last day. I don't think I will give up on that space. But what I'm what other businesses need is basically the, 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 the court system is in a mess. And, you know, it hasn't been easy for a lot of landlords or for tenants. You know, I wish there was a medium. I wish there was, you know, more resources that were kind of like helping to work things out and um, to help with negotiations as opposed to, uh, you know, lawyers going back and forth and just exhausting resources that were so limited to begin with. So for me, that's like one of the highest concern. I would, I would be amiss if I said anything else because right now that's so um, near and dear to me. And I appreciate that. And, and actually when this call is over, I'm gonna have someone on my team call you to see if there's anything we can do for you. Um, at the very least, what, what we can do is, is, is help figure out the next steps, but yeah. we'll have someone from our office call you. Thank, Thank you for you. that. You. Um, and Lena, if you had uh, you know, an ask of how we could support uh, you over the next, and I would say years, because I think the reality is getting uh, anywhere near uh, what our economic output was pre-pandemic. It's going to take a couple of years. So how can we support your business as government? There's two things. One, and I'm just going to say this and everybody, everybody wait, traffic. <laughs> um, I don't, I mean, I understand. I, I ride bike. So I love bike lanes. They're the best. But it's just like, I don't know what happened between... I'm going to say like the early 2000s and now with traffic, there are so many. I mean, I appreciate everybody wants a car, everyone wants a vehicle. I appreciate having everyone having their own vehicle, but it's just like it's so congested in the five mm -hmm. boroughs. And Queens and Brooklyn are the one, and Manhattan, Manhattan has always been that way. So we, we won't really touch that. But Brooklyn and Queens, it was easy to get through. And, you know, I'm a, I'm an EV, I own an electric car. So, they, you know, thank government for putting in or helping to put in electric chargers everywhere they could or private businesses who put in private, you know, chargers. But it's still crazy when you're trying to tell your, your, your customer, um, telling your customer that, um, sorry, my, the driver's going to be late because he hit a wall of traffic on the Holland Tunnel or, um, yeah, no, that is, um, that's a little bit of a problem. And I, like, and, and I know that for everybody to be, you know, for employees to be on time at work and, you know, con uh, uh, commuting times, I mean, it's something to look at, but I know that there's not going to be, I know that it's not going to take, you know, it's not going to be dealt with in a year. That's going to take years, but I just know that everybody would be comfortable and feel better. And, um, and I think the second thing is just, <sighs> I know that there are a lot of programs funding out there for, for starting businesses and that's great and wonderful. But when you have companies that have been forever and like, it's like, you, you wanna stay where you are. Like we, you know, our factories in Brooklyn, we have an opportunity right now in a couple of years, we have an opportunity for growth, but we need to, we're already at capacity and, and over capacity. 
and we have to find a building or another location to be able to move our industry. And if it was, if it's me having to do this, honestly, I probably would just like cut and run because the amount of money that has to be expended to be able to re kind of like reopen my business is 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 hard and i know that, that that that's the that's the issue for many family businesses that have been around for 60 something years for 70 something years for 80 something years when, and then you you know you go to some government um events and stuff and you kind of feel like you're not being heard and i'm like you know like we want to stay in new york we want to be a new york business like that's where we that's where our you know, culture from that's where we, our bread and butter is but it's it's hard to stay like it's almost like do you just stay where you are or do you move somewhere else so that you have the capacity to grow it's almost like what we're looking for is a um a maintenance fund or a maintenance support if you will um the closest example i can give is when for for someone like me there's lots of programs out there that teach you how to run for office but there's nothing that teach how to stay in office. And it's the same thing. There's lots of grants uh, that teach, that give you money to start a business, but there's very few that uh, look at helping you stay open or even expanding what you're doing. So that's a very good idea for us to keep in mind. And when you talk about traffic, um, I have also uh, seen um, this and I've taken lessons and I'm trying to figure out how we could even do this, but I've seen in other countries, um, one of the ways that they address it and, and I have this dream uh, uh, of perhaps implementing something like this or even a pilot in certain countries in Latin America, they have something called peak and plate. And that means during peak hours, only certain car, depending on the last number of your plate, your car can actually be out on the street. And if it's out in the street, um, during that time, um, you get a fine. And so what that has managed to do is actually reduce the traffic during peak hours and it has helped the smog in, in the environment basically um, in those particular countries. I have a feeling in a country like ours where we're so individualistic and obsessed with, um, with our own rights, you know, at the cost of others, it would be very difficult, but a girl could dream that, you know, we can put the needs of the environment in our community and frankly, even small businesses before um, before we continue to destroy um, something as beautiful as 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 uh, as our country, um, and so thank you for that, Lena and Kelsey. Uh, if you had one ask uh, or several asks of government on how to support you in staying open and becoming, you know, and getting back to a more normalized e uh, economy for your business, how, what would you be asking for? Thank you. Um, so there's two things, and actually one. I just realized that it was a good one to speak on because I saw what someone wrote in the chat about um, affordable housing, but for businesses. So um, definitely rent, of course, especially when you're starting a business is a huge expense. And um, I started my business in my apartment and I had like one room that was dedicated to my business and I had some employees come in and we work in there. And then um, as I outgrew that space, um, I was trying to find like more affordable office space. And um, through my search, I found um, uh, New York Designs, which is based in LaGuardia Community College. And it is an incubator space for small businesses. Um, so the rent is much more affordable. And um, they also have, um, it's kind of like a community in there of other small businesses. So um, they also have workshops that all of us could attend. So that is a great option for people looking for, um, you know, starter office space. I think that's great. Um, there's a limit to the number of years that you can stay there. Um, so now my, my business has moved on from there, but it was a really important um, step when my business was first starting and growing. So I think, you know, continuing to have like incubator spaces for businesses is super important. And then of course, like putting it out there so people will see it. I mean, even being able to put something like that on like Zillow or, you know, realtor.com or Trulia or these places that, you know, a lot of us look for space, um, I think is super helpful. Um, and then the other thing that I have found to be really important and empowering for my business is 
having access, like actual access and dialogue with government, um, like how we're speaking with you today. Um, Azra and I are both part of the 10,000 small business program with Goldman Sachs. And through that, um, there's a huge adv advocacy program that puts us in touch directly with um, you know, state senators, um, with House of Representatives, with all sorts of different people. And I think, like Azra was saying, having that dialogue that direct dialogue is so important and helpful and even just having like phone numbers that you guys answer is great like to know like okay i can call this number and someone is actually there to speak with me you know it's not like calling 311 where you're on hold for three hours and you're like what am i doing on this phone call um i think having you know a dialogue with small businesses and being open to you know speaking with us and email, phone, whatever that is, I think is empowering and, and helpful for all of us so that you guys can hear what it is that we need or are looking for. And then we feel like when we reach out, there's someone there to, to speak with us. Thank you, Kelsey. And I actually think that one of the most important things that we as government can do is listen. Some, and, and frankly, as politicians, many times what all we do is talk, 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 and you know, express our views and our concerns, but not often do we sit down and say, hey, what do you need? How do, can we support you? And that is what we're trying to do here. And, and I appreciate that input. And one of the things that uh, I hope our colleagues um, can follow is in doing just that, you know, have a closer relationship with the small businesses in their communities. Um, I'm gonna give a shout out to um, to uh, assembly member Brian Barnwell, because I think he is one of the best at doing just that. Um, I, I feel like at one point I even heard he had a small, uh, small business, uh, outreach committee or something of the sort, which I think is fantastic. Um, I um, I have my own outreach committee and it's headed by the Queen's Chamber. Um, I absolutely adore their team. I think they have done a fantastic job um, and I'm going to take a uh, um, some ideas from, from our conversation today. Uh, Kelsey, I had no idea about this uh, incubator space and I think it's fantastic. And why don't we have any uh, much more of this? And why don't more people know about it? And so yeah. I'm gonna be looking to figure out how I can support um, issues like that um, and making sure that, that, uh, that we're supporting small businesses. And so to close us off, um, I am going to read a question that we have uh, from the public um, uh, that we have here in the chat. Um, it says, hello, my name is Clive White. I actually know who Clive is. How are you doing, Clive? Hope you're well. Is a commercial banker. What are some things that financial institutions can do better to inform, advise, and sometimes even make connections for women business owners? Um, so whoever wants to take that, this question, happy to have you answer it. Uh, should I call on you guys? Uh, Kelsey, why don't we go back to you? And uh, Ezra, I, I saw Ezra raise her hand. Ezra, go ahead and yeah, answer. I, I think uh, financial institutions can play a huge role. I actually just put in the chat that micro lenders. Um, during the pandemic, I remember reaching out to RADC. I hope I said it right. They're in Flushing, Queens. Um, they're a micro lender. I've had history great history with Ascendus, which was formerly Axion East, okay? As micro lenders, their impact was great because what they did is not only provide um, the funding, which was, again, small loans, but they were actually very instrumental in creating connections, um, helping with education. The only reason I got into 10,000 small businesses is because of my the micro lender, Axion, which is now Ascendus. Um, through REDC, and again, I'm, I'm hoping I'm saying this right, um, through them, Wells Fargo has like a huge initiative where they have assigned uh, a marketing agency to work and redo our website. The amount of work that they're putting into it is actually mind blowing. And the larger banks can actually do this for smaller companies through the micro lenders or through their own programs that will help kind of uplift. Mentoring is so underrated. I mean, you have to have, you know, small businesses need that guidance. And another thing that I just want to say is that small businesses are the ones that can create 
the solutions for the problems that we're having. So if we're not kind of in committees, like Lena and myself are on a committee that was with manufacturer, and our whole goal is to get the word out there and to kind of uplift additional manufacturers. But we know the problems so we can find the solutions. And I think that's where the government and the chambers need to leverage the relationships with small businesses to actually find solutions to um to and to and improve. Astra, I think you know there's something to be said by those closest to the problem or closest to the solution. I yeah. think having uh committees or input or even as uh, uh Kelsey said a direct line of conversation with uh with the folks in positions of, of power that can help make the change is key um and so as we come to an end uh, as we're closing um i'd love to give each of you an opportunity to give us some final thoughts uh um they on, on whether it's on what we talked about something that we didn't mention um something that you think we should know about your business or anything that you want to say so let's start with uh lena and then we'll go on to Kelsey and then Astra. Go ahead, Lena. Um, the best thing I could say is that honestly, even though we work tirely, like we continuously need to grow our businesses. That's one thing that will never stop, but having a balanced work life, if possible, do it. Because it is very, like we don't, under, like it, it's, funny how we're always told like we have to give 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 like give everything of us but sometimes you have to stand back and be focused and you know find out how how much is it really worth how much are you sacrificing is it really worth it is it worth that and like if it is the worth the risk go at it but if it's not take a pause relax meditate or do yoga or if you need to you know, sleep blast, on it, <laughs> sleep on it, blast Aretha Franklin, you know, in your car while you're driving or, <laughs> you know, sublet any music here. Um, because our strength comes, our, our strength comes from empowering. So if we feel empowered, then we empower other women because they see us doing in this and they, you know, they see us doing it the right way. And every then they'll be like, oh, I want to emulate this because they're empowering other females to go out and be in business and or empowering other males. Like it's 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 it doesn't matter the sex. It can be non-binary by doing it through empowerment and a work life balance. It'll 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 create it for everyone else and everyone else will benefit because they see us creating these wonderful businesses with, with all the craziness of our lives, kids, husbands, and everything. But there still has to be that balance. Thank, Thank you, you, Lena. Thank you. Go ahead, Kelsey. Thank you. Um, I think the one point that I want to emphasize is really building your team and knowing all the resources that you have around you and not being afraid to call on them when you need help um, or you need, you know, want to collaborate on something. Um, there's just so many instances where my team has helped us all succeed. And I think that is such a key thing, whether it's, you know, like, let's say I'm just thinking like a sample needed a little bit of adjusting. Someone didn't do something quite the way that the client wanted. And then the next person in the, in the manufacturing line needs to adjust the sample because of that, like having people that are okay with do, working on these edits together, you know, understanding that if they help you create, you know, edit this and make it right, then they're going to get the order, you know, like that's that kind of stuff I think is important with just having that community with your team and always um, reciprocating when someone, you know, has gone out of their way to assist you. Um, and then that also just extends into the team of like your, your networking group. Um, you know, I do think it's important to be a part of at least a couple um, organizations that are related to your industry. Um, so like I'm a part of one that's specific to the design industry. Um, and then I'm a part of the uh, 10,000 small business group that's for all small business owners. And I think 
Um, you know, we're all busy as small business owners, so it's hard to be involved in like a lot of them, but at least having a couple to keep you in touch with other people in your industry and keep you informed. And it's such a great network, I think is super, super awesome and will help you grow and help you get business and help you have resources and all sorts of things. So that's what I would say. Thank you, Kelsey and Azra, go ahead. Oh my God, I was so wowed by Kelsey and Lena's answers that I forgot the question. <laughs> so the question was, um, you know, what are some final thoughts on something that maybe you forgot to highlight, wanted to make sure that you emphasize on uh, some pearls of wisdom you wanted to share. It's, it's more like a free flowing, you know, la last words. <laughs> It's hard to follow those uh, amazing, uh, I, I kind of agree with both of them so much, the networking, uh, the self care, uh, you know, we, we need to put that out more. But in terms of uh, businesses, I feel like, you know, um, I don't know, I guess we, sh we really need to follow our, our dreams and, 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 and know that there are, we're very lucky to be in a place uh, like the U.S. where, you know, there's, we have a voice and we have the ability to kind of um, have these networks and, and I guess use them to our best ability. I, I don't think that I would have been able to create or to kind of work on a way in a box if it wasn't for all these resources that I got and the support, really. So I think that that's important to share. There's a lot of resources out there. Thank you, Asra. And, and I think my final thoughts, um, and this is not just for you ladies, but for um, any uh, of the women who are uh, watching now, one of the things that we always strive for is uh, to mentor others as they come up. Um, for many of us, uh, we didn't have the resources and had to fight for every single inch of a win, um, for every single award, for every single contract, for every single uh, um, million dollars, you know, uh, that you eventually make. Every single thing was a fight for many of us. But the reality is you now have a position where it doesn't have to be a fight for everybody, where you can mentor someone um, to come into the business, to be successful, to learn from your lessons, um, and, and, and with the commitment that they also do it for another woman. Because I think that that's what we have to instill in a lot of the, the people who are coming up. Um, to make sure that if I'm going to mentor you, if I'm going to support you, you got to do it for someone else and be able to reciprocate that. Um, and I think my absolute last words of wisdom as we leave are be proud of your own work. Um, I said this earlier, women and women of color, we do not give ourselves enough credit when we actually win at something or actually do something that's good. Um, we are taught that it's not very ladylike to be proud of yourself. And you know what? It is the most ladylike thing that you can do. You have worked really, really hard from uh, turning your uh, business into something that saves lives and supports people, Kelsey, to figuring out how to keep your doors open, Lena, and to even instilling and in, 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 in somehow figuring out how to mix business with uh, uh, social consciousness, Asra. You have figured out how to survive this pandemic and, and how to help your business do the same. And so you should be extremely proud of yourselves. And I'm going to give you a round of applause because you have been amazing and I want to wish you all a uh, happy women's history year let's make it a year I feel like we we deserve it this time around and with my eternal gratitude to the Queen's Chamber and their amazing team who are constantly highlighting the work of small businesses and women-owned small businesses um, my special Thanks and love to uh, Tom Gretsch and uh, of course all his team, but especially to Tom Gretsch and his work to support us. And I hope to see many of you in person very soon. And that's that. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Have a nice, wonderful day.